remember a time many years ago when my husband and I lived in San Diego. And while we were there, there was a period of time in our lives when we worked together in the same office. Well, I remember one morning, he and I both woke up very sick. You know the feeling. Your throat is sore, you're achy, and you just cannot lift your head off the pillow. Now, I don't get sick very often, but we were really sick. So sick that neither of us could go to the office, not just for a day, but for a week. We couldn't even cook for ourselves. We could not do anything. And the worst part of it was that we couldn't even help each other. All we could do was lie in bed and moan. When you are that sick, you think you never will get better. Two things helped us. First, we began taking antibiotics. And then, I'll never forget what one of my friends did. She made us chicken soup and she left it on our front porch. And I'm gonna tell you something, it wasn't just the canned kind of chicken soup. It was the real homemade kind with big noodles and chunks of chicken. You just cannot imagine what that chicken soup did for us, along with those good antibiotics. Amazingly, we began to get better. Today, we are beginning a new series together entitled, A Heart That Hopes in God. A heart that hopes in God is anchored in God himself. And over the course of our time together, I am going to be sharing with you a theology of hope. And this is something that the Lord has taught me over many years, but has really brought home to me in the last three years through some intense suffering. And I am going to contend with you that the things we are going to learn will determine your course in life. Why do I say that? Because I think we all have times when we wrestle with difficulties, darkness, and despair, the three Ds, I call them. Why? Because we live in a fallen world and we all suffer. Trials, difficulties, sufferings are universal. They vary in intensity and sometimes it's the little things that are as bad as the big things. Jesus said in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper and you can see that there are a thousand things that can make you anxious, worried, and downright depressed. What I see is that the world is sick and in great need of a savior. But what I see even more is that even within the church, there are thousands who are in need of a chicken soup of sorts that will bring healing, help, and heart comfort. God's kind of chicken soup, His kind of medicine. What we need these days is a good dose of the Word of God. It's medicine for the heart and soul. Today, I want to take us into one of the pinnacles of Scripture, Paul's letter to the Romans. It's considered to be one of the greatest pieces of writing on doctrine that is contained in the Bible. Now, just to give you a little bit of background of Romans, in Romans, and I'd like for you to turn to Romans 15, but to give you a little bit of background of this, in Romans 15, Paul is talking about how others need our encouragement and how it is going to require a denial of self. And right in the middle of what he's saying here, he gives some important teaching about the Bible, the Word of God. So let's look at it together. Turn to Romans 15, verses 4 to 6. Here's what Paul says. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. 
Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, what we see here is that the Word of God is medicine for the heart. And the medicine of the Word will bring you to a state of spiritual wellness. So how does God use the medicine of the Word in our lives? Well, there are three things that God will do with His Word. But in order for you to have the medicine of the Word do these three things from the Great Physician, it's going to require three necessary actions on your part. First of all, God will speak to you today in His Word. You see, the Bible is alive for you today. God has something to say to you today. It says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. You see, it was written then, but it is meant for you now. That means that the Word of God never grows old and it never grows stale. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active. And I love what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 15 verse 16. He says, Your words were found and I ate them, and your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by your name, O Lord of hosts. What is to be our response in order to experience God speaking to us in His Word today? Well, you must open the Word of God, and then you must read it. You see, if you are sick, if you don't call the doctor or go to see the doctor, what good is it that there is medicine that can help you? We need a good dose of the Word, our medicine, from our great physician. But we cannot get his prescription unless we open the Word. He has a verse, a passage in mind to give to you today. But you must open the Word. You see, a Bible in the hand is worth two in the bookcase. That's what I always say. A couple of years ago, I had a profound experience with the Lord in Genesis 8, and the Lord taught me a huge lesson about hope. It happened very simply when I was sitting in a restaurant, and I opened to Genesis 8, and there were four words that spoke to me, but God remembered Noah. And those four words literally had neon lights around them in my mind. And the Lord spoke so profoundly to me in that passage that it led to the writing of two books, as God showed me how He never stops working in our lives, and that there really is a cycle to trials, and that the heat of a trial will abate at some point in God's timing. Here's what's so profound to me, though, about all of that. What if I had never sat down with the Lord that day and opened the Word? I would have missed what He had to say to me that day. It was something so profound that it's led to two books on hope. And I wonder how many people are running around in desperation and the Bible is just sitting on a shelf. God's Word was written for our instruction and it is alive today. We need to open it and we need to read it read it, and we need to live in it. Then, the Word is incredible medicine because the Lord will instruct you in His Word. It says, the Word was written for our instruction. And that word for instruction is didaskalia in the Greek, and it means that which is taught. It is the word for doctrine. You see, it is the teaching of the teacher. And in this case, the scriptures are the teaching from our teacher, the Lord. Now, here's what I see in this. The Lord has truths that He wants to teach you, and what He teaches you will be medicine for your heart. 
He is intensely serious about everything he has to say. Now, what's necessary on our part? We must be teachable. I often think of Mary and Martha. You know the story, and it's in Luke 10, verses 38 to 42, but I'd like to look at it. Let's just look at it real quickly. Luke 10, 38 to 42. Here's the story. Now, as they were traveling along, he, Jesus, entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations. And she came up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Now, as you think about that passage of scripture, I want to ask you, where was Mary sitting? Well, she was sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. And what did Jesus say? Mary has chosen the good part and it will not be taken away from her. You see, teachability, my friends, is a choice. Teachability means that we sit at the Lord's feet, our Bible is open, and we are listening to what He says in His Word. Teachability is the mark of maturity. It's not responsibilities, but teachability that mark the mature man or woman of God. Some of the busiest people in the church and some of those with the most important titles, unfortunately, are some of the most spiritually bankrupt. Why? Because they haven't chosen the good part. Like Mary. The Lord is speaking, but they cannot hear. Sometimes it's the most unsuspecting servants of the Lord that are the most mature. Why? Because the Lord is speaking in his word and they take him seriously and they, they open the Bible day by day. I was talking with one of our staff at our church and I've rarely met someone with such a depth of love for the Lord or such seriousness about getting into the word of God and hearing what the Lord has to say. Yet I wonder how many really know this about this particular man of God. He's one of the most teachable Christians I know. And oh, how that ministers to me. I need to be more teachable. All of us need to be more teachable. One of the great character qualities of some of the great men and women of God is their teachability. I had the opportunity to meet Kay Arthur a while ago. And what a woman of God. She stood in front of a huge crowd and shared some challenges. And then she just humbly shared that she needs to think upon what is true, pure, honorable, of good report. It's things that I have heard her share on her videos in Philippians. What a teachable woman she is. And that's one of the things that makes her such a great teacher of the Word of God. It's God's Word making its way into a teachable heart. You see, those who are teachable know their need. Only those who know they are sick will go to the master physician for the medicine they need. The day I have no interest in getting into the Word of God is the day I need to be like a G. Campbell Morgan and lock up all other books into a cabinet, then lock myself in my room with my open Bible and allow God to speak to me from His Word. When G. Campbell Morgan did that, he said this, I didn't find the Bible, the Bible found me. Oh, may we all be teachable so teachable that the Lord may teach us. May those who have ears to hear, let them hear. And then the Lord will encourage you in his word. It says through the encouragement of the scriptures. 
The word for comfort is paraklesis, and it means exhortation, encouragement, comfort for the purpose of strengthening and encouraging in the faith. It literally means in the Greek that the word of God stands by you in your heart. How does it do this? And what happens as it is standing by you in your heart? Well, the word of God changes your perspective. It takes you from the temporal all the way to the eternal. Why is this important? Because the temporal is going to fade away, but the eternal lasts forever. Matthew 6.20 says, store up treasures in heaven. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. The things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The Word of God transforms you. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. 2 Timothy 3.17 says that it equips you for every good work. In other words, God gives you what you need to face the day in His Word. What is it going to take for you to experience this aspect of God's medicine it's going to take perseverance. That word in the Greek is hupomone, and it's the spirit which bears things, not with passive resignation, but with blazing hope. Perseverance grows in your life through trials. It means that you wait for God's word to work in your life. God's timing is different than our timing. And sometimes the trial seems as though it's going to go on forever. But persevere, dear friend. Wait for the Lord to do His work with His Word. I have noticed this. Often when the wait is long, the work is great and the outcome is incredible and amazing. Always know that God is always at work. Never, never give up. In 1952, a very brave and strong young lady waded into the Pacific Ocean. Florence Chadwick was determined to break another record. To date, no woman had ever crossed the channel between Catalina Island and the California coast. Long distance swimming wasn't new to Florence. She was a seasoned long distance competitor. In fact, she was the first woman to swim the English Channel in both directions. But this was a 26-mile stretch, and the conditions that July morning were not optimal. Not only was the water incredibly cold, but a thick blanket of fog had settled in. And then, to make matters worse, there were sharks who trailed her course and had to be driven off several times. Florence's coach and family followed along in a small boat, cheering her on. Go for it, Florence. You can do it. But it was foggy, real foggy. And even when she'd been swimming for 15 hours, Florence still could not see the shoreline. Discouraged, very tired, she finally took her last stroke telling her family she just could not go on. She quit. They all consoled Florence as they pulled her aboard and she collapsed with exhaustion. Well, as it turned out, Florence quit much too soon that cold July morning. She swam 25 and a half miles, but because she couldn't see the end, she couldn't see the coast, Florence fell short of her goal by just half a mile. Had she only known one half mile? By the way, Florence didn't give up. She did give it another try, and just two months after her first attempt, she became the first woman in history to swim the 26-mile channel. She set a new speed record as well. Now, what will be the result of all of this? What is that state of spiritual wellness that the Lord has in mind for you and for me? Very simply, one word, hope, hope.
It is, according to the scripture, in order that you may have hope. The Greek word for hope is elpis, and it means the desire of some good with expectation of obtaining it. Biblical hope is the confidence that knows with certainty the facts, the reality that's found in God's word. God gives hope. Hope is the ability to hold on to the truth of God's word. And hope is what our study together is going to be all about in a heart that hopes in God. And I am going to contend with you that the Lord intends for you and I to live in hope. When the word of God is at work in us, our lives are going to begin to shine with hope. You just cannot help it any more than you can help what happens when antibiotics begin to take effect on an infection that is in us, an infection that's sent away because of and healed because of the antibiotics. Well, in our time together, we are going to live in some of the Lord's greatest prescriptions for our heart, those in the Psalms. The Psalms are going to be like antibiotics for a hurting heart. The Psalms are the Cadillac of prescriptions for the heart. And oh, what hope will come as a result of our time with the Psalms. We will hear God speak. We will be taught by the Lord and we will be encouraged. And our hope will be known to all. R.C. Sproul says, hope is the ability to listen to the music of the future and faith is the courage to dance to it in the present. D.L. Moody is one who knew how to listen to the music of the future. Hope is what characterized his life. The year 1899 marked the deaths of two well-known men. Dwight L. Moody, the acclaimed evangelist, and Robert Ingersoll, the famous lawyer, orator, and political leader. The two men had many similarities. Both were raised in Christian homes. Both were skilled orators. Both traveled extensively. They were widely respected. Both drew immense crowds when they spoke and attracted loyal followings. But there was one striking difference between them their view of God. Ingersoll was an agnostic. He was a follower of naturalism. He had no belief in the eternal, but stressed the importance of living only in the here and now. Ingersoll made light of the Bible, stating that free thought will give us truth. To him, the Bible was a fable, an obscenity, a humbug, a sham, and a lie. Those are his words. He was a bold spokesman against the Christian faith. He claimed that a Christian creed was the ignorant past bullying the enlightened present. Ingersoll's contemporary, Dwight L. Moody, had different convictions. He dedicated his life to presenting a, re a resurrected king to a dying people. He embraced the Bible as the hope for humanity and the cross as the turning point of history. He left behind a legacy of written and spoken words, institutions of education, churches, and ultimately changed lives. Two men, both powerful speakers, influential leaders, one rejected God, the other embraced him. The impact of their decisions is seen most clearly in the way they died. Read how one biographer parallels the two deaths. Ingersoll died suddenly. The news of his death stunned his family. His body was kept at home for several days because his wife was reluctant to part with it. It was eventually removed for the sake of the family's health. Ingersoll's remains were cremated and the public response to his passing was altogether dismal. For a man who put all his hopes on this world, death was tragic and came without the consolation of hope. Moody's legacy was different. On December 22, 1899, Moody awoke to his last winter dawn. Having grown increasingly weak, 
during the night, he began to speak in slow, measured words. Earth recedes, heaven opens before me. Son Will, who was nearby, hurried across the room to his father's side. Father, you are dreaming, he said. No, this is no dream, Will, Moody said. It's beautiful. It is like a trance. If this is death, it's sweet. God is calling me, and I must go. Don't call me back. And at that point, the family gathered around, and moments later, the great evangelist died. It was his coronation day, a day he had looked forward to for many years. He was with his Lord. The funeral service of Dwight L. Moody reflected that same confidence. There was no despair. Loved ones gathered to sing praise to God at a triumphant homegoing service. Many remembered the words the evangelist had spoken earlier that year in New York City. He had said this, Someday you will read in the papers that Moody is dead. Don't you believe a word of it. At that moment I shall be more alive than I am now. I was born of the flesh in 1837. I was born of the Spirit in 1855. That which is born of the flesh may die. That which is born of the Spirit shall live forever. You see, D.L. Moody knew the music of the future found in the Word of God, and his life was characterized by hope, the ability to listen to the music of the future and he surely danced to it in the present. Dear friend, as we embark on this study together, I want to ask you, do you have a heart that hopes in God? Is your spiritual life in a state of wellness, reflecting hope? The Lord wants to apply His Word to your life today to speak to you, to teach you, to encourage you, and ultimately to give you hope. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for the encouragement of the scriptures that give us instruction and ultimately Give us hope. Oh Lord, I pray for every single one of us as we embark on this study of a heart that hopes in God, that you will bless us richly with your word and ultimately that you will give us a heart that hopes in you. In Jesus' name, amen.